cheesy part, and then the learning part. Okay, so what you see here is you're going to see two pieces of paper. One piece of paper has a line down to the center of it. Okay, this is going to be your take home sheet. You know, uh, the, the goal of this is to really have a tangible, clear understanding of what love is and what love isn't. All right, and um, so when I talk about those two points, uh, I'm going to ask that you put them down here. Okay. The second part is I'm, I'm a person of wealth of trivia, and I always throw out songs or, you know, anything that comes to mind uh, that's not relevant to the key learning points. So you can put them on your, your B tab, okay, or your B, B piece of paper, okay? So uh, another thing I want to point out is that um, although I do write gay fiction, uh, love is universal, and so 99.99% .99 of this presentation is about the universal element of love that can apply to anything. I'm only going to make one LGBT reference um, at the end, uh, just to help uh, people clear up some misunderstandings to themselves. Okay. So, on to my cheesy presentation. Uh, how this started. First of all, the original title was "How to Teach Love to Scientists and Engineers." Not that they needed any special lesson. <laughs>
We've been together for four years. And he's looking to me. You know what I said to him? I know the PC term for tall people. <laughs> <laughs> so he looked at me like, okay, this one's crazy. <laughs> I know that one. Um, but I said, you know, stand up. How tall are you? And he gets this all the time. He tells He rolls his eyes and goes, I'm 6'7". I was like, oh. He's like, do you work here as well? No, I'm an engineering student at University of Victoria. I was like, okay. But he was really sad. He wanted to talk about, you know, his relationship. And I let him talk. And um, he was much, I, I would say he was, he was kind of drunk, okay? And um, I, was, I was cheering him up, telling him a few jokes and stuff. And he's like, oh, God, you are so funny. And I was like, um, <laughs> well, I really had to go back. And he goes, no, don't go back, please. I need you. And he goes, I like you. And I was like, yo, oh, it's fine. You know, this happens in life. You know, heartbreak happens. And he goes, no, I really, really like you. He goes, would you come back with me? And I'm like, where? And he goes, to my heart. I was like, no, I have friends that's not on the agenda. Sorry. So I ordered the drinks. I'm still talking to him. I said, I hope everything works out for you. And I took my drinks and I walked back to my friends and I passed the drinks out to my friends. And while I'm passing out the drinks, there was someone pulling at my shirt. So I turn around and I was ordering, and I was looking up and he goes, No, Ralph, you don't understand. I really, really like you. And this is what I said to him. I was like, Oh, Ordick, you're on the rebound. <laughs> You'll be okay. And he screams, Rebound! What's this rebound? I don't understand. And starts crying. The whole pub stopped and looked at me like, Robert, what did you do? <laughs> I was like, Ugh. It's like, Honey, Ordick. So I sat him down and I said, Look, I'm a romantic writer. I think I can help you out. And he's like, Oh, you romantic writers, you poets, you make them sound so easy. It's horrible. It's dark. It's ugly. I'm like, Whoa. Why don't we work out something together that you can walk away, I can't make your past better, but I can make your future clearer on what? And he was like, oh, you know, I was curious. And he's like, okay. And so I got out a piece of paper and we started working together on what you're going to see now. Uh, now, with that said, I have a confession to make, okay? And I'm sure Dean Bessie right here does not want to hear this. <laughs> but I am a lobbyist. Uh, you know, bad, bad words, you know, conjure up when you say lobbyists. I'm sure Dean Bessie's thinking to himself, Robert, I can take any of this lobbying, I just can't take being called Dean, so would you cut that out? <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Mark is probably thinking to himself right now, should I cut my losses and escort him out the door? He never told me this. <laughs> but, I just feel that love gets a bummer. That's my issue. And that a lot of things that we attribute to love um, are really love's not to blame, and I'm going to show that to you. You know, and the funny thing is, in the history of love, romantic love is relatively new to human existence. It's only about 900 years old. You know, and I won't go into the details of that because it's going to take forever. But it was always a positive experience, something to look forward to. It wasn't until the 1700s until you got like, oh, and love was started by the romantic love. The love that we know was started by the French and perpetrated throughout the world through the troubadours, which were the French poets. All right? I say that because throughout the evolution of love, even within its early beginnings, it turned dark. So in the beginning, it was happy. Well, the beginning wasn't really truly happy because um, what happened was is that a lot of the warriors before they're like a warrior, warrior for your brother, you know, and they're like, no, you will get these gorgeous, gorgeous maidens come back, these courtly maidens, and these maidens are like, no, we don't want these guys, they gotta, they gotta court us, we are a court, and that's where you get courtesan and courtesy from, is uh, courtier is the uh, action of courting someone like they, okay, so I say this because by 1700, love turned dark, the writers, the French writers, like Moliere, Racine, started writing things that were about loss, you know, a heartbreak, heartache, um, struggles in love. And the irony about it is the French people throughout the ages continued to persevere with love. French writers by the 21st century abandoned love altogether. Okay, so I kind of thought that was kind of different. All right, so now I'm going to tell you what we will learn what we won't learn, okay? And what we will learn is that love and relationships are very different. And what we're going to learn about is love, not relationships. Why do I say that? Because, as you know, you can be in a relationship with someone, it can be wonderful, but you're not in love with them. Also, 
you can be in love with someone, but not able to continue a relationship with them. That's just the nature of things, but we're not going to touch about relationships, okay? We're going to really focus on love, but we're going to come back to this, okay? So, moving on, here we go. This piece of paper, this first piece of paper, you all have it? Yes. You need something to write on? I'm good. I'm good. I want you to flip it over. I'm going to ask you three questions, okay? Don't try to impress anyone. This is for you. Remember, this paper, I'm not going to ask you to share it. Um, this paper is for you, so this is the conversation you have with you. Now, when I ask these questions, I want you to go with what your first thought is. Don't overthink it. We tend to overthink questions. This is uh, something that you should be clear to yourself the, the moment you say it. And even if it's stupid, Write it down, okay? Now, how we're going to lay out the questions is like so. I need for you to leave a little space below question two because we're going to draw something. Ooh, right. So, you ready for the questions? Yes. All right. First question. What is the opposite of love? And it could be a one-word answer, it could be whatever you think, but what is the opposite of love? I'll give you a minute. Or whatever, it's just whatever comes to mind. And write out the question as well so you remember what is the opposite of love. So you remember what I asked And we have 10 more seconds. Now the second question, again, write it, but make sure there's enough space because we're going to draw something underneath here. Writers and 
Um, and that's not true. All right, and we're going to walk away. I always tell when I do this. Now, this is the third time I've done this um, presentation. And I always tell people it's the greatest gift I can give you. If I give you love, that's the greatest gift I can give you. So this is your take home on love. So, uh, I'm going to now have you flip over the sheet. Queen of Soul, she's singing with us. 
full of science people are standing over here looking at us like, these people are crazy, you know? What's going on here? And so we're over here, they're over there, not happy with us. And they decide to rain on our parade, because it's not raining over here, it's raining over there, because rain is science and it's scared of us too. So, <laughs> this is what science did. Booyah! The current scientific evidence across almost all fields is that there is no scientific evidence whatsoever to support the existence of the soul. So you're hearing over at the School of Arts, I'm like, ouch! <laughs>
So we come in, we process through it, and then you go and we push out with emotions. Okay? So I'm going to give you an example of how this works um, so that you can understand how the psyche works. And we're going to always start from the bedroom. Okay? You're in the bed, you open your eyes, and there's fire. Fire all around you, right? So here you are, you're in psyche, you know, instead of drugs over here.
They love precedence. So we have a precedence here. Okay? We have something to draw upon so that we know we're on the right track. There it is. The definitions of white and black. They are not colors, they are the endpoints of spectrum, right? Where white is all color, black is absence of color, and all the colors in between where you see that little asterisk make up all the colors of the world. Okay? So love is the endpoint of a spectrum. Okay? So we know we cannot house love here because this is where emotions are housed. But most people, remember I said most people get love incorrectly? Most people house love here. And I'm going to show you why this is dangerous, okay? But the only other place is here. So, in the soul, or where our energy is, we find love. Okay? So then what is the opposite of love? The opposite of love isn't hate, a lot of people feel. The opposite of love is indifference. Okay? Ellie Wiesel, a Holocaust survivor and scholar and writer, is the one who came up with that. The opposite of love is indifference. Now remember, I'm talking to scientists, and this is what Ulrich and I came up with. Remember energy? What are the signs of energy? Plus sign, negative sign. You feel something or you feel nothing. That is the opposite of love, and it applies with our universal understanding of how energy works. Okay? So, why is that dangerous? Remember we said this is uniquely you, this is self, right? Let's look over here. If this is self, then what is this? Let's look at energy. If I took the energy from this computer, if I took the energy from that lamp and showed it to you, there's no indistinguishing part. It's energy, right? So this is a selfless area of our existence, okay? And why is that relevant? It's relevant for this. Remember we're an input? In the psyche, we are an input. That means I want, okay? You have to have an input for you to give an output. What's wrong with that? Well, let's look at it, all right? My number one question I ask everyone, why you're in a relationship? Hurrah. You're in love? Hurrah. Why do you love that person? Number one answer I get, I love them because they make me feel good. So think about it. The moment they stop making you feel good, do you stop loving them? Exactly. <laughs> but think about it. I love love. All right? It's cliche, but you always have love. It's always with you. It draws out from here, and it radiates out. Right? So this is dangerous because the inner the ego, and the house love there is unstable. You're dealing with your day-to-day -day self, your day-to-day -day struggles, and you're putting love in a spot that doesn't handle it. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples, okay? Uh, but it swings like a pendulum, it's unstable, and love is a constant. Remember, energy is a constant. Now, so we answered the first question, right? What is the opposite of love? The opposite of love is indifference. Now let's go on to the second question. What is the greatest test of love? And by the way, I forgot to mention this. I'm very good on, if you want a clear understanding of ego and it from writer's point of view. Ego, has anyone seen the play Salome by, um, oh, sorry, Oscar Wilde. I, Oscar Wilde, Salome. Is that, you saw it? Do, do you know the story? I can tell the story real, real quickly. So uh, ego, remember, 100% self, 100% your desire. So Salome was the stepdaughter to King Herod in Judea. 
And she walked out, she's a beautiful woman. She walked out on the patio and she heard this beautiful singing from a prisoner, from the prison cell. And she went down there and said, I want you. Your singing is so beautiful, I want you. And I want to kiss you from that mouth that sings. And it was John the Baptist. And he was like, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> And she didn't care. She's like, I'm going to get your kiss one way or the other. And he's like, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so she went back to her stepfather and said, if I dance this really, he was throwing a party, so if I dance this really, really erotic dance for your guests, can I have anything I want? And he's like, all right, you get it. <laughs> so she does the famous dance of seven veils, and all the men and women go wild for her. And she turns to her stepfather, who's the king, and says, Okay, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. So he sends the soldiers down, cuts off his head, and gives it to her on a platter. She runs out into the courtyard where the moon blows on her and starts kissing him passionately. Okay, and Herod goes out there and says, That girl is batshit crazy. <laughs> soldiers, take her out. <laughs> but that was the example of ego where. He said no, she didn't care. She, she wanted the kiss regardless, you know? Not the kiss that he'll fall in love. He's headless now, there's no winning. She just had 100% ego, she wanted a kiss, and she got it anyway she wanted. Now, the story I would use for it would be the story of Echo, the Greek mythology. Does everyone know that one? Okay, so Echo and Greek mythology was a nymph. And his job was, Zeus was a bit of a player. Zeus was the ultimate god. He was a bit of a player. And his wife, Hera, did not like him running around cheating on him. And so Zeus said, Echo, do me a favor. Entertain her while I go out and play. And so that's what she did. Go into to Hera and start you know, getting her attention so she won't look for Zeus. And she, Hera caught on to this. She got really mad. She goes, you're going to be cursed by me because we're doing this, and you're only going to have the ability to say the last word. And Echo was like, ah, I can live with that. <laughs> and then Echo ran through the woods, and she ran into Narcissus and thought he was the most beautiful thing she ever saw in her life. And she was so scared to present herself because he was so beautiful. And remember, she could only repeat. And Narcissus was running and goes, who goes there? And she says, who goes there? She can only repeat the last word. And Narcissus says, show yourself. She says, show yourself. And so now, Narcissus caught on to that and said, okay, I will show myself, you show yourself. So Echo thought this was great. I will show myself. So that was the last word. She did, and he rejected her. And she was so hurt, she faded away until just an echo existed. So lack of existence, lack of self-worth, the story of Echo is a very good example. Okay, moving on. Come on. Okay, so remember question two, we're on to question two. Question two. Remember I had I need for you to draw a picture? Under question two, under your question, I need for you to draw this. Well, my husband passed away 
But let me tell you something about love. And she took a paper cocktail napkin or a paper napkin from her girl and she took it up and it through. She said, when we were first married, it was wonderful. You see that line up there? She started drawing that line. And she said, then I got pregnant. But then I lost the baby and got depressed and the line went down there. But then I got out of my depression. I had a, a second child and things were really, really wonderful. Then my husband lost his job and started drinking. Yes, America is really good at reality TV because they tell you a lot of stories. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then he, you know, got himself you know, fixed in. We lived happily ever after until he passed away. And she said, if uh, there were more pluses, you see where the circles are? And they're all minuses. That is love. So the answer is the greatest of uh, the greatest test of love is time. Time is great system. Now let's test that theory, okay? So I ask people, what's the greatest love story you know? Number one answer I get, Romeo and Juliet. What? <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, they knew each other just for a little over 96 hours. Juliet did not know that Romeo farted in bed every single night. <laughs> Romeo did not know that Juliet had right breath every morning. 96 hours didn't give enough time versus 44 years to see if they have lasting power. Okay? So that is from a lady in Longwood, Florida, who explained to me what love is. How am I doing? We're down to our last question. Did Mark throw me out? Yes, no. They're quiet, I don't think I'm going to have to go. <laughs> We're down to our last question, aren't we? We got the first two, but we have the last question. So I don't even have a chart for this. And there's a reason why I don't have a chart for this. Because it's very simple. What is love? You're going to write this down as I say it. And number, below number three. Love is... Ready? Love is what you are willing to do for someone else. Love is what you are willing to do for someone else. Think about it. Here we go. I can't make you love me. You can't make other people love you. That's their decision. I'm going to give you some examples. I have a million dollars. Will you love me? You fun to spend. Can't guarantee that I'll love you. Or some lady or trainer says, I have big breasts. Will you love me? It'll be fun to look at, fun to play with. I can't guarantee I'll love you. We go back to, again, psyche and those statements, the million dollars, I want a million dollars and I'll love you. Is not where love should be. And you know this. Okay? You can only control yourself. What you really are looking for is mutual love. Two people give it. That's what you're really looking for. Now, why is this helpful? Because this makes it clear when you meet someone where they are coming from. Alright? Are is there love coming from this side or is this love coming from this side? Now, it's hard because we are designed under psyche, it's a survivalist skill. That's how we deal with the world, okay? But there's 7 billion people on the planet. We can evolve beyond psyche now. Uh, our survival rate is very, very high. So we need to move over, and this is the number one question that I get in this presentation. How do I move my love over here? And we're going to get to that. But I'm going to show you some examples of this. Again, with writers, okay? Remember, love is what you're willing to do with someone else. So there are two famous writers, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, and their lives interchanged and intermingled. One day, uh, Simone de Beauvoir was a very, very famous writer all in herself, and she made this statement. She said, I am going to dedicate my life to support Jean-Paul Sartre and all that he does. And what did John Paul Sartre say to that? He's like, ah, she's a woman, she can do what she wants. And for years, 
She gave her love because that's what she was willing to do. And they had ups and downs. They had trifles. And they settled on a very loving friendship. But that's what she was willing to do. So, we're going to get more into the details of where I disagree on how people address love. And the number one part is heartache. Number one question, when I say word association, love, most people will say to me, heartache. And I'm to say that love is not the byproduct, or heartache is not the byproduct of lost love. And I'm going to show you how that is. Now, science has a word called limerence. I don't really like that word. So I'm going to show you the word I chose. <laughs> So when you first meet someone you're attached to, your heart goes pitter patter, you're discovering each other, everything's so cute. <laughs> but then there's a thing called the balance of reality. And the balance of reality is the make or break point for any relationship. And this, I'm not going to get into the detail about this because this is really about relationships, but it's just trying to show a point. And on top is solidity or solidarity. We never came to a conclusion of which one was the proper word. Um, but this is your, cohes your cohesion with your partner, where you are content, and that's a very important word, content, because you're going through life now in solidarity, and there's a contentment. You know, she was married to this man for 44 years, the lady at the cafeteria, and that solidarity was broken. But then where is this housed? This is housed here. Because the balance of reality, how you deal with your inputs, are in your cycle. So, it's not the loss of love, and I'm going to give you a perfect example. It's the loss of the continuation of the solidarity that you were hoping for and that you wanted. Alright, so, here's the example. A man was married to a woman for 60 years, the majority of his life. He was married to her, right? But she dies. He's lost. He's heartbroken. We were really heartbroken. You know? Does he love her any less? No. He doesn't love her any less. The love isn't lost. It's the loss of the solidity. Uh, solid. I don't know. That's the word we made, we made up. Solid. Um, he had this contentment. And the chemicals in his body were aligned with hers and this contentment of togetherness, and it's gone. So the heartbreak is actually from the loss of solidity, not love. He still loves her 100%. It's not less. So the heartbreak isn't from loss of love, it's from loss of the solidity from yourself. And it's sad, I know. And I promised how to get love over there. Now, this is easy and hard at the same time. To get love from its true point, you have to learn how to turn on sight. And how do we learn as humans? The best way we do it is through meditation. In meditation, you see what's true. Did everyone see what's love got to do with it? The Tina Turner story? She would have a horrible marriage. And there was no love in that marriage. And she, had her, she was really swinging on the edge. And she had to go deep, deep inside herself and meditate to find love for herself to get enough energy and self-confidence to leave Ike Turner. Okay? So, to move yourself to the truth, you really have to shut this off and look for what is truthful. And this is very, very important because it comes to my last slide. And that is... Remember I said I was going to say one thing about sexual orientation? A lot of people come in having, you know, have feelings for someone of the same sex for the first time. And they're overthinking. And one of the most dangerous things that you can do to yourself is to come to a conclusion in the wrong spot. So here's my advice to those. If this is your first encounter with someone and your sexuality is in question, Shut this off. Shut this off and ask yourself, 
where am I with this person? Am I in love or indifference? And why that's important is because this is the foundation that defines you and that person, not this. This is the society's teachings. You can't be gay, or you can't be a lesbian, or you can't. And society's going to play an in and ego role where you might think less of yourself, you know, in this area, when truly you don't have to, because all you have over here is just love. And that is how I teach love to scientists. And 